medical sense, but just to stress her impact, um, because for many years she's loomed incredibly large as a feminist intellectual activist who has pushed against the boundaries of various, West, various left-wing consensuses, including feminist ones, seemingly feminist ones. She's obviously challenged conservatism, uh, the right wing, uh, as we well know, but she's also been remarkable in challenging the conservatism of what appears to be transformative. Not only has she consistently critiqued evolving forms of patriarchal and colonial violence, she's also scrutinized nationalist and seemingly counter-colonial responses. And I think she'll speak to that today, as well as responses that are ultimately conservative that seem to speak in the name of African feminism or women's rights. Um, in short, she has refused ever to soft pedal interventions that lead to anybody's discomfort. And this discomfort, and I think she would be the first to admit it, includes her own. <laughs> I've had the privilege of having known Pat for many, many years, and she is always, alongside her incredible generosity, warmth, and friendship, encouraged me to see things differently, courageously, critically. And seeing the world critically isn't reassuring. It isn't easy. It isn't a matter of endorsing platitudes about oppression that leave us convinced of our existing positions and opinions about the world. It means shifting, confronting changes and fears, daring to live and see the world differently, but also realizing that there are payoffs to this uh, of joy and self-ease. And it's been incredible how many people have commented on Pat's photograph. And we see this, the payoffs of joy and self-ease <laughs> in the recent photograph of you. It was taken, I think, a few weeks ago. And it says it all. We all want to be this way. <laughs> Pat's thinking and life, I think, are currently the culmination of a journey that she has been undertaking for many years. This journey has led her to process the implications of feminist radicalism for profoundly embodied struggles for freedom. And I think this is, for me, what her title gestures towards. The title is Embracing Contemporarity, Theorizing and Living Our Feminist Futures. So Pat will speak for a bit, for as long as she likes. And thereafter, we'll have an open discussion because we all have the freedom to, to contribute. And of course, we all realize that we have the responsibility to interact in courageous, but also um, respectful ways. Pat, thank you so much. Let me hand over to you now. Oh, thank you, Des. I've been waiting for this moment as well. <laughs> Because really, I feel like I'm just stepping into a new terrain, leaping off the cliff, the proverbial cliff, and doing what Bessie had uh, said she did, um, uh, which Gloria Bossman was sharing in a recent interview. And uh, uh, I want to read what Bessie said, because Bessie was a front runner, she is a front runner. You know, she has been for us in Southern Africa and Desiree's work on Bessie at really gifts us with deep, deep insights about the legacies and the courage that black women have brought to, the, uh, to our struggle to be free. And that this moment is not one that's crafted by each of us individually in isolation, but by each of us as a collective struggling for our freedoms, resisting, pushing back against the boundaries and the uh, brutalities of patriarchal power. And she says, I forcefully created for myself under extremely hostile conditions, my ideal life. I took an obscure and almost unknown village in the Southern African bush and made it my own hallowed ground. My work was always tentative because it was always so completely new. It created new worlds out of nothing. And this she said in, of course, um, in this very special, text called A Woman Alone Autobiographical Writings. And I wanted to step into the future by retrieving Bessie's uh, life. 
uh, the dynamism of Bessie's life because uh, this is what I draw from and I think we all do when we embrace our feminism and hopefully uh, we will now take the next step into contemporarity, which is really um, opening the windows and the doors uh, in our lives and stepping into the future in new ways. And Bessie Head's courage remains a wellspring of inspiration and motivation for me. And I know for many, many uh, other women on this continent. So I've titled my presentation, uh, Embracing Contemporarity, um, Theorizing and Living Our Feminist Futures. Because I'm at a point in my life where after, I mean, as I enter my 70th uh, decade, I mean, my seventh decade this year, um, and I'm so full of energy and power, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's like one of the most beautiful times in my life, but also, of course, a very precarious and hazardous time to be alive, uh, considering the backlashes that we are facing as radical women. So let me begin in the future by explaining what I mean by contemporarity as a feminist epistemology. It's partial, it's uh, evolving, and it's open to everything each of us as radical women brings to the notions and imaginaries upon which we hope we can ground our future presence. And I try to, to, to rupture the divide between the present and the future by speaking about both in the same breath so that we can uh, uh, um, recognize how powerful this moment is in terms of bringing our agency and our courage, our experiences, our knowledges, all of us who are in this room today sharing our dreams and our imaginations for a different future. We are positioned at, at the cusp of this amazing time on this continent, which is outside of the dominant paradigm of neocolonialism and capitalism and imperialist plunder and lies. We really have begun to bring together all the work that we have done as black women living on this continent and who love our freedom. We are bringing it now into a consolidated moment of theorizing and living, making new choices, making different choices, becoming, becoming the women that we uh, would love to be, the women whom we arrive as in our spirits, in our eroses, you know, in our capacities, but which of course have been suppressed and erased very systematically for millennia by patriarchy. So I want the context for this notion of contemporary, which I've spoken to in past conversations that I've shared um, with this community of radical women. I want to just quickly go over the context because I think contextualizing our feminism is so, so powerful and so productive for us in terms of understanding what our feminism has become as we have grown it, lived it, uh, cultivated it. <laughs> You'll notice that I, I often speak in, in language that is, that is about what I do most of my day, which is to grow food. And I find a certain ease and comfort um, in that language because it's so nurturing. So, but context is so important for us because it enables us to dismiss the claims, the old tired right-wing black nationalist claims that feminism is a European uh, thing that we have been mimicking, you know? So I don't even waste my time with that nonsense anymore. But I do acknowledge that it continues to affect the ways in which women think about themselves and how we, we calibrate our identities and how those accusations keep us locked 
in old fossilized ideas about who we are as black women on this continent. And of course, retain the power that men and infrastructures of patriarchal violence uh, continue to exercise on us. So context is important and I'm situating uh, this notion of contemporarity in it. Um, the, the ideas of contemporarity are young and emergent. They reflect an impulse which draws from the legacies and experiences, narratives and stories, shared lives of resistance to patriarchy, especially to a resistance to nationalist, feudal, colonial and neo-colonial uh, systems which define patriarchy in our region and on our continent. This is the context. But of course, the women have always existed in a dynamic resisting uh, uh, relationship with patriarchy. And I will come to that later on when I pose some of the new questions and the theoretical challenges that uh, arise when we embrace cont contemporarity. For example, a claim that is often made that African women have always been feminist, you know, and I think it's so dangerous. It's so facile and we need to interrogate it, but I'll come to it later. But in terms of context, it is this struggle, this resistance, this rejection of the various elements that construct patriarchy as a system. Contemporarity reflects to me um, as I explore it, an instinct, an impulse, which recognizes the need and urgency to imagine and conceptualize new discursive sites, new discursive spaces um, through which we can explain to ourselves, amongst ourselves and share our lived and future realities. It is both anticipatory of emerging challenges, it is celebratory of a different future, and it also uh, prepares us, enables us to prepare for the imperatives uh, of resistance as we claim our freedom. Contemporarity, as I imagine it, also re represents a clear rejection of existing hegemonic paradigms and epistemologies which are embedded in colonial, feudal, and nationalist orthodoxies. Settler racist discourses and masculinist discursive habits, even from the left, which, look, which lock us in conceptually and imaginatively. And I think this is really important. For me, it was the activation of this instinct that always uh, surfaces inside my soul, my radical soul, uh, when I feel constrained, when I, I become aware of constraints. I've, I mean, I've been like this ever since my childhood. And I, it's really a powerful means of bringing myself into the moment, into the challenge. And I just, when I was preparing with, for this conversation, this sharing with you, I just realized, I know it, but I, I realized it intellectually, that we have been stuck in these old paradigms and that they are hegemonic because we continue to situate ourselves in their epistemologies, in their ideas of philosophy, of what is knowledge and truth and ethical and et cetera. And, and they shape us, they impact on our feminism in very nuanced and very deeply pervasive ways. So I, 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 for me, contemporarity is, is a stance. It is a rejection and it is a movement out of this hegemonic, um, this incarcerating notion of how knowledge is produced, who produces knowledge, what language means when we speak. And we know as feminists, that these are tremendously difficult questions for us because we haven't yet begun to produce, to create our own languages where we are situated. So the rejection, for example, of this demand, it's almost, it's a normative 
expectation in this region in particular that black women must speak to racism because we are radical. I mean, why should I? <laughs> I don't benefit from racism. I wanna spend the last quarter of my life speaking about the things that give me joy, the things that enable me to be the most beautiful that I can be, the things that enlighten me in the directions of my freedom. I don't want to talk about white privilege anymore. White people have to own white privilege and do the discursive work to reject it. Of course, we have to engage with them in some ways. But personally, I'm tired of that old trope that Black women's bodies are the sites where all the intersections of cruelty and violence uh, you know, meet and happen. Yes, we know that. But I think with contemporarity, we also have to know um, and, and prioritize that we are the most beautiful humans on this continent, on this earth, and that we have in ourselves the uh, unstoppable power to transform our lives, our communities, our continent, and of course, all the places that we live in in the world. So it is a rejection of the epistemologies of colonialism and also of the so-called South. And it brings me to a, a difficult kind of red herring um, arena where we have had a pushback in this conversation in the past uh, about decoloniality and what Des calls the decolonial turn, which I think is a really cute way of putting it. And then, um, I, I, you know, it's, for me, it's something that those who are interested in it in the academy can continue to, you know, uh, get paid for. Uh, but I don't think that uh, decoloniality, the discourse as it is being engaged in now and, and the way in which it's be, being articulated, I do not think that it has positioned itself outside the status quo. Um, and so I'm bored with uh, the hamster on the wheel and um, I want to step out. I want to step outside the dominant thinking and knowledge systems and habits and craft new feminist imaginaries and new language. And this is what uh, uh, contemporarity offers us. And uh, I like that, uh, that uh, Des uh, alluded also to something that I really, really like, which Paula Gunn Allen uh, um, uh, said, and which I've, I've referred to many times uh, when I share with my sisters, is we have to leave the reservation. We have to get off the reservation. And we, own, we can only do this by engaging in boundary busting and border crossing. Now she was speaking about the existence of Native American women within the settler colony of the United States. Um, but you know, often when we speak as feminists, regardless of where we're situated and the material conditions that shape and inflect our feminism and our resistance energies, we often speak for each other as women uh, uh, of resistance. And Paula Gunn Ellen really speaks to my, my non-conformist, my non-status um, um, uh, uh, quo accepting part. She activates and stimulates it. And, uh, and I love this. I, and I would, ad, 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 I would invite you to read her work. She's done really beautiful work, bringing the political and the spiritual together. Um, because the people of North America in particular, but the whole of the Americas, um, share a, a deep, deep wound with us as Africans, um, um, a wound which is, uh, has been inflicted by the same people, uh, the same humans who went everywhere. And what they couldn't destroy, they took back um, and claimed as theirs. So um, I love her. And I, I refer to her a lot and she's an ancestor now. And um, I'm hoping that she'll come back soon. Yes, Paula Gunn. Yes, it's correct. It's for, um, from uh, Nunu. Uh, Paula Gunn Allen. 
um, and uh, she, her work is lovely. I wanted to share that as a little gem, a gift that I bring to this collective. Secondly, um, uh, uh, contemporarity enables us to find the place where we can theorize in radical and uncompromising ways and where we can reflect on what the boundary is in political and personal terms. This is something that we all struggle with. When we enter the state or when we traffic in the state or even when we tiptoe in and out of the state, we encounter the boundary and often we allow the boundary to change who we are, what we have come to say, how we wanted to say it. And often those changes leave marks, indelible marks on our consciousness and we become other to ourselves. So the political and the personal is brought to the notion of encountering the boundary and resisting the boundary. And for me in this, uh, uh, this sharing, I would like to refer to a, a massive, uh, I, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a strategy, it's a myth that is continuously used and just thrown around and people just bandy it around, but it has so much impact on who we become, and who we are as, uh, as black women on this continent. And when we say we are Africans, um, it's so glibly bandied about as though there is a consensus that is complete, locked, never to be changed. And it's a boundary. And it's a, it's a boundary that you dare not go close to. Um, because if you do try to, to, to approach the boundary, the backlash is swift. But I wanna challenge these boundaries, this boundary that is made up of many circles of smaller boundaries. Many of them play out within the heteronormative, the heteropatriarchal family, for example, sites that are owned and controlled by males, even when there cannot be bosses in the public, they are bosses in the private. And they, they revel in that. And they insist that women recreate and, uh, and perform, reiterate um, uh, uh, what are considered uh, the sacred elements of African identity and African culture. These are taboos and fears, which are foundational to our patriar patriarchalization as black women. We have been patriarchalized. It's a process, a long process. And, you know, removing the layers of patriarchalization is what, of course, all feminists engage in and confront by living our, our politics. We can only do this when we adopt an anti feudal stance and when we interrogate the ubiquitous and seemingly unchanging and unchangeable and untouchable notions of Africanness and authenticity. Now, I hope I don't get the ludicrous accusation that I am denying my Africanness or that I am implying that black women should not be Africans. We are Africans. <laughs> Our identities are crafted in the cauldron of colonialism and brutality, imperialist brutality and naming and marking as black in particular ways. Many of us, all of us every day, seek to retrieve the beauty and the power and the positives in being black and being Africans. But it's a Herculean task. Oh, I wish there was a woman whom I could uh, uh, refer to rather than Hercules, you know, that long dead uh, Greek man. <laughs> anyway, it's Herculean. Um, and, you know, we have to, we have to encounter it. We have to interrogate it. And for me, contemporarity is about going there to those taboos, to those, uh, those uh, no-go zones where our identities are owned and defined by black males. And of course, 
white men who collude and whites who participate in it, in the collusion around what it means to be a black woman on this continent. And, you know, we, there is no other group of humans, if you think about it. Uh, there's no other group of humans who are locked as deeply and as compliantly into feudal mythologies and claims of exceptionalism uh, the way Africans are. The boundaries around identity as Black people, and especially as Black women, are tightly drawn, vigilantly patrolled, and the backlash against any questioning of these sacred bulls is swift and vicious. So I bring contemporaneity to this boundary um, resistance, to this leaving the reservation, crossing the boundary, you know, and pushing back all the time at it, and, you know, becoming Africans in new ways. Um, in contemporary ways, uh, and, and insisting that feudalism cannot and will not define me and my Africanness. While I uh, draw on the histories and histories of resistance of becoming Africans in the most positive ways. So contemporary is the long view of the future through feminist visioning and resistances. It is both anti-feudal and anti-nationalist. Two structurally and ideologically repressive and dominant systems in women's lives. Contemporary requires that we theorize critically and name so-called culture and tradition for what it actually is, an archaic patriarchal system of practices and conventions which continuously reiterate and reinvent supremacy and privilege for black males. Contemporary further requires that we insist upon becoming contemporary citizens by rejecting the mythologies of feudal patriarchy and recrafting our identities in con as contemporary women. Contemporary enables for the becoming of free black female citizens and imagining the new ideas and activisms uh, which enable us to close the gap between us and the neocolonial state through a rejection of the segregationist practices that underpin the collusionary power relationships between feudal patriarchs and neocolonial elites. And this has been a very useful collusion between those who are largely situated in the rural spaces, but they also have actually little, um, little nodes in the townships, for example, across our region. They have penetrated the urban areas um, and they, they have tried to recreate the infrastructures of feudal repression and surveillance and policing of black people. It's part and parcel of the colonial project that has been inherited by the black, uh, the vicious black elites who now occupy the state. So when we engage in contemporary, it enables us to reject the, sub the subjecthood, the subjecthood, which is a core element of feudal patriarchy. This sense that we, we are obligated to be something that somebody else is telling us we have to be in order to be African. No, we don't have to. <laughs> I always tell people when somebody says, oh, but you have to. I say, no, my dear, there's no have to. I don't have to anything in my life except die and breathe. Those two, <laughs> I don't have a choice, but everything else, I have a choice. And I choose to be contrary. I choose to be different. I choose to be outside the system. I will always situate myself in the places, in the new nodes of transformation and freedom. I refuse to be defined by the status quo. 
So what are some of the new theoretical and activist possibilities that could emerge through our embrace of contemporarity? First of all, we can pose new questions, interrogate the meanings and lived experiences uh, in, in the moment of colonialism and who and what the black elite is doing with the state in relation to, for example, persistent settler capitalist and imperialist hegemonies and plunder. We can see it all around us, it's become normative. When we do this, we will be able to understand the neocolonial state more clearly. We will be able to critique it, to unveil it, and to expose it for what it is. It's ideological and political limitations and failures. And we will be able to go beyond the bemoaning of unfulfilled false promises. In South Africa right now, you know, people are writhing in the agony, in the knowledge that they know that the system is not going to change. I hear them on the radio calling in, expressing this deep agony that people have. It's a sense of loss. It's a sense of, you know, I can't even, I don't even know how to articulate it. It makes me so sad and so furious that this, this amazing, amazing community of human beings who live on this continent are trapped in a system which we can actually change. We just have to remind ourselves that we have the power to create the alternative. But I hear people, you know, just yeah, over and over and over and over bemoaning the failure, the betrayals, the falsehoods. And that is a trap. You get stuck. And then the system just perpetuates itself. And the big fat cats continue to eat, to lap up all the cream. Um, another uh, possible theoretical possibility that emerges is that in each of our specific locations of work, struggle, relationships, we can initiate new and courageous ideas and we can translate them into new expressions of feminist theory and practice. And this is what I'm personally doing in my life, living as a vegan, growing my organic food, leaning into nature, and also realizing, wow, it's a completely massive new world of intellectual contestations. I've been reading through the debates in the Western, largely white Western Academy around veganism and feminism, the conflations, you know, it's a massive debate and it's good that it's happening. But we as black women who live on this continent, who have also imbibed so many of the bad habits that colonialism brought with it. Of course, we had our own bad habits prior, but we've become in so many ways a, 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 a representation of commodifies, commodified humans, the commodification of relationships with the earth, with, with other living beings, you know, uh, with uh, resources, everything. Um, and so uh, for me, this possibility of becoming contemporary through contemporary uh, 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 and to find new courageous ideas and translate them into new expressions of feminist theory and practice is really what keeps me in this place, in the song. Besides, of course, producing absolutely the most delicious and sweetest beetroots in the world. <laughs> which I totally love and which are so good for my colon <laughs> and make Patricia happy and full of joy. The third one is through contemporarity, we can explore the political and conceptual learnings that reside in and are continuously renewed in the lived realities and struggles of excluded communities. These are many all over on our planet. We can try to list them. Often we try to be inclusive. We know the main communities uh, that make up the, 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 the excluded collective. And uh, each and every one of us can learn from the specific struggles 
of all these excluded community and the challenges that we all face as we try to find our ways out of the hegemonic status quo. These diverse and resisting communities provide the oxygen that feminism has thrived on ever since it emerged as a systematic and articulated politics. And uh, we can also explore the implications of statements or expressions, which I referred to earlier on, like uh, African feminisms. I mean, the pluralization of our feminism. We're the only group actually of women on the planet who engage in feminism, who, have, who are pluralizing our feminism. And often even when women in other sites, in other spaces, refer to feminisms, they are implicitly referring to, uh, to black women on the continent. And we need to ask ourselves, why do we predicate our feminism as black women on this, uh, on this uh, continent with an identity moniker that we do not define or own? This takes this links with the point I was making about Africanness. Right-wing conservative traditional notions of who Africans are embedded in masculinist and androcentric, you know, philosophical worldviews that add us and stir, and barely so. So we need to ask ourselves, if we're gonna produce the new theory, if we're gonna find the new ways of living, of becoming the most beautiful uh, parts of ourselves, uh, how are we going to respond? to this you know, crazy situation where the politics, the only politics that defines us as women who have consciousness, agency, the only one, all the other political formations are masculinist. And we have brought this naming into our politics. And what has, what has happened to our feminism? In, in terms of the relationship with nationalism and black, black, black masculinity. And finally, uh, when we say, this is another very important theoretical issue that I'm battling with, I am, it's not clear, but I am situating it within this adventure, this journey of contemporary. And I'm asking myself, what, when we say African women have always been feminist, I hear this often, what do we actually mean theoretically and ideologically? Because we know that feminism is a conjunctural political uh, 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 philosophy, a politics of resistance that is articulated at a particular moment in the human journey. It draws from legacies, from memories, from tellings of resistance, from lived experience, but Feminism in and of itself as a politics, as a discipline, as a worldview is consolidated at the end of this, of this last millennium, basically the last hundred years, century of this past millennium. And, and so when we say glibly, African women have always been feminist, what are we doing? Here's what I think happens when we say that. First of all, we shut down the feminist debate in Africa. It becomes truncated and it's silenced in ways which very uncannily imitate the declaration that being African means the same thing for everyone who is black. So you have these large statements that are ideologically embedded in nationalism that are expected, that are assumed to be acceptable to everybody. And within the, com the feminist community, we are beginning to see an articulation of this, these influences of nationalism through statements like, uh, African women have always been feminist. My grandmother was a feminist. My great-grandmother was a feminist. 
without actually elucidating what exactly do we mean? You know, it occludes the necessary conversations that we need to have about who we are and what our feminism is in this place called Africa, in this moment of a contemporary uh, uh, um, exigency. Let me put it that way, because it is a contemporary moment of many, many challenges. Secondly, when we make those statements, uh, that statement denies the crucial conceptual fact that feminism is a specific political identity and that being, being female does not make you feminist. Feminists are female, but being female doesn't make you feminist. And we need to make that conceptual distinction because if we don't, our politics is going to be absorbed into the mainstream. We're gonna have another GBV situation where, where we were talking about sexual violation, patriarchal supremacist impunity, all that has been suppressed and erased. And now an acronym stands for everything that we have been fighting against, that we've been trying to articulate. We've been situating in new laws in the jurisprudence systems. Everything has been shut down, homogenized, flattened, and now it's GBV, GBV this, GBV, and of course it's closed. The space is closed conceptually. Uh, in terms of activism, we can see the impact of that kind of strategy of silencing us and homogenizing us. So I, these are some of the theoretical issues that I think present themselves to us when we embrace contemporaneity, when we bring forward our courage, we wear it as a beautiful blanket, as a cloak, and we speak to our power. So in conclusion, I want to speak a little bit about bringing feminism back into our lived reality and into our lives as radical women. And I am choosing to situate my feminism in the resistance against ecocide and how new resistances are em emerging as we fight back against ecocide. I began to name myself ecofeminist as convoluted and as, <laughs> as problematical that, uh, as that notion can, it, it still is. And of course, it's, it's typical of feminism. Uh, language and identities is that we battle with them and we carve out little spaces in them and we situ resituate ourselves. And I've done that all my life. I went from a socialist feminist to an African nationalist feminist. And then I just, you know, and it's important to always return to our identity, to always check, am I speaking my truth? Am I standing in my identity as I define it? Am I this person whom I want to be, whom I love and whom I will become as I live this uh, point in my life? So for me, how do I bring my feminism into my life? I began by reclaiming intersectionality. It's a crucial feminist concept that came out of all the many battles that we have struggled with on our bodies, in our bodies, in our community, amongst ourselves as Black men. Although people claim that Kimberly Crenshaw is the inventor of this notion, and yes, she did contribute in terms of the legal articulation of this notion, I personally don't go into you know, putting a name on a person's name onto a concept. That's why I always start by saying contemporarity is a wide open, evolving, new, radical, safe feminist space. It belongs to all of us. And we bring everything, all our gems 
everything we, 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 we gift to the feminist radical community, we bring to contemporary. And I'm hoping that in the 50 years that, uh, that, uh, that uh, I hope I still have, I'm going to work hard to have them, that I, I will be part of this community of theoreticians, well, not theoreticians, uh, radical feminist intellectuals who will craft and, um, and fill up this notion. And hopefully this notion will take us to where we wanna go. So reclaiming intersectionality is really, really important to me because we can stand by and allow the right wing and the moderates and the conservatives to take our language. So you, those of you whom I share with and converse with, you know that every opportunity I have, I refer to the necessity of outing the appropriation of feminist language. And we have to find ways to always protect our language, take it back, retrieve it. And retrieval is really an important notion within the theorization of feminism as we go forward. I said something somewhere, I can't remember, in one of my sharings, and uh, one day maybe I'll return to it. <laughs> but there's always some new stuff popping up in Patricia's head, like it does, of course, in, in the minds of all radical women. And so, um, uh, let me return to the feminist theoretical tool, because it is a crucial critical means of explaining our, our worlds and changing our world and reimagining different futures. Okay? It enables us to bring class and race to the debates that are swirling around the relationship between feminism and veganism in the Western Academy. And of course, those of you who are familiar with it, you will know that there's a very, very vibrant debate going on particularly around the work of Carol J. Adams, who wrote this very interesting text called The Sexual Politics of Meat in, the 19, in 1990, and where she, she, she draws a direct connection between the violence against women and other, other than human animals um, and uh, sexual politics, uh, particularly pornography um, and, um, uh, and prostitution. And of course, it's a red herring because now we also know that women like Sheila Jeffries have been in the forefront uh, of um, uh, objecting to the use of uh, uh, the notions, the, the, the theorization of um, women's sexual work as sex work. And it's a huge, huge debate. I'm not going to go into it. Maybe Des can, um, can facilitate. Sorry, Des can facilitate a conversation because this issue of violence is resurfacing. Um, I wonder, people, can you hear me? Can anybody just indicate in the chat if you can hear me? Because I've lost Pat. I think we've all lost you, Dave. Oh. Her symbol is muted. Her says that she's muted. Uh, Dumbo, can you? Okay, I'm on. Am I back now? Yes. 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 Okay, so uh, the 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 punks who roam virtual space, <laughs> hunting <laughs> hunting feminists, radical feminists, bring it on, you punks. Anyway, so I was talking about um, the new work. The new work that, uh, that is going to present itself to us um, and how we, we need to be anticipatory. We need to, to use contemporary as an anticipatory epistemology that will enable us to situate ourselves where we want to be. And of course, not only to avoid that recurrent claim that we are mimics, but also so that we can make full use and we can explore this moment as a moment of opportunity for the crafting of new ideas. So the new work, for example, refers to 
uh, the challenges that transgender theorists and activists um, are opposing to the conflation of women, uh, women's, women and animal experiences uh, with patriarchal violence. But it takes me back to what has happened to our conversations, our, our discussions around violence and violation. Not only did GBV shut the conversations down, but we ourselves have not crafted the new language, the new uh, uh, um, uh, opportunities and energies to continue to interrogate the ways in which patriarchy normalizes the killing and the brutalization and the mauling of women and of female humans. And we hear it all the time. We hear it, I mean, it's all around us. And the statistics, and it's become blase and it's frightening. So what contemporarity enables us to do is to return to the source, to paraphrase my dearest Cabral, and to ask a new type of questions New, to ask new types of questions that are also drawing from the new questioning that is happening across the radical worlds on our planet. So for me, um, you know, making veganism a core element of the theorization and practice of contemporarity in my reality has been very important. And uh, I'm looking forward to many, many debates in the future. I already am positioning myself in a place practically. I'm drawing from my uh, leanings into nature, my learnings, my experiences, what is happening to my body, how I'm unlearning the hatred of an older body, an older female body, something I didn't even realize I had imbibed. But of course, we grow up as females, being told that the older female body is crap, is a dustbin. And we know that patriarchal practices have reiterated this. Men who quote unquote, take young women because women, their wives no longer menstruate. Their wives are no longer sexually, uh, you know, available. Their bodies are ugly. Their breasts have shrunken and they're heading south, you know, their arms are wrinkled. All the, the hatred and the misogyny, we learn it. it as we become patriarchalized. And this moment of being vegan, of finding the beautiful in Patricia is also about living in my body in new ways and yeah, looking at the wrinkles under my arms <laughs> and then using that as a moment to unlearn the self-hate and to relearn uh, the power and the beauty of the Black female body. And there are many, many, many other opportunities that this moment of vegan living, uh, of being engaged in a battle against ecocide, of naming myself an ecofeminist, you know, of living a solitary celibate life, choices that I love and I revel in. These for me are the nurturers uh, of what I'm going to bring to my feminist sisters, to, my com to the community uh, of my feminist sisters. So the intersection of veganism and feminist radicalism in resisting ecocide and redefining my identities and lifestyles is a core element of whom I am becoming. And um, I want to stop there and just conclude by saying that contemporarity is, radical, is a radical feminist conjuncture. Contemporarity is a radical feminist conjuncture. It is dynamic and visionary. It is discursive and intellectually stimulating. It enables a new becoming. People ask me, when did you become vegan? It's always <laughs> a confounding moment for me because I'm still becoming. 
or they ask you, so how did you become feminist? As though it's a, a status, it's a static, I mean, well, okay, English is uh, abandoning me now. Um, it's a, 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 it's a, a, a situation of status, status, where you, know, you become and then that's it, that's the end. But it's an ongoing, amazing experience of living in new ways. So it enables a new becoming. It is a site of introspection, an embrace of our most subjective and most beautiful selves and expression. Contemporary enables us to create and calibrate the feminist meaning and practice of the contemporary through a retrieval and revitalization of our legacies, memories, dreams, and longings. It is about freedom, about becoming free through the creation of the alternative to capitalism, feudalism, imperialism, neocolonialism, and barbarism. I want to fi finally say the last thing is uh, Shalja Patel, whom I totally love and whose name gets wrapped around my tongue, recently presented uh, on joyful solidarity. And it was so lovely to hear a radical feminist from this continent speak about joy and how central joy is to our new becoming. You know, and she says, she reminds us that joy is a nutrient. She says many other beautiful things about joy. You know, She's, she asks, what does freedom feel like internally and externally? How would we move and sound and be if we were free? Well, for me, this is the time to reach for our freedom and live it in all its splendor and power and to live it through an embrace of contemporarity. Thank you. Um, the speaker is Shailja Patel. She's at Amherst University and she was speaking at the three, at the five colleges um, center. I think it's called the five colleges center. Yeah. Yes, Shailja Patel. She's gorgeous, totally gorgeous. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> like I love all the radical, beautiful women in the whole world. <laughs> all right. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I love my head in the room. Thank you, my sister. Beautiful, Patricia. Beautiful, as, as usual. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree with you, Patu, <laughs> totally. Oh, so um, th there was such a lot also. I think that many people found it difficult to raise comments or ask questions, and we need some time to digest. But um, one of the things, well, there was a question from Cheryl O'Brien, mm -hmm. which had to do with how to change the system. And Cheryl, I'll, I'll invite you to ask that question yourself, because you might want to flesh it out. But I'm going to abuse my position as whatever um, and, say, and ask you, Pat, to just say something more about your sense of the connections between the knowledge, um, you know, at the moment, the knowledge production around decoloniality and uh, what you understand as nationalism and the naming, the politics of naming. Can you just say something more about that? I mean, you have been fleshing it out at different stages, but yeah. Especially in relation to um, talks that you've had recently. Is that, is that too vague? Um, well, I mean, I can, I can refer to them. Okay. Yes. Okay, so what happens is this. Like I said, it's a hamster on a wheel. Oh, it's such a horrible mm. expression. Mm. Okay. It's such a horrible expression. I'm not ever going to use it again because, again, because it's it's an it epitomizes such terrible cruelty. And look at me. I'm talking about loving uh, sentient beings, and I ah. Okay, so this unlearning, you know, is so hard. 
it's almost indelible the way that the language and everything else patriarchal marks us. So I apologize. I take it back. It is this, uh, this trap, this is a sense of incarceration that we find ourselves in where we are repeating the norm and uh, uh, as though we are saying something new. For example, whenever we talk about uh, patriarchy um, and systems of patriarchy as indigenous to Africa, that, you know, African societies were the most advanced and nationalists claim this and the evidence is there. We were, we had, um, in the human community, we had some of the most advanced, commu I mean, uh, uh, societies on earth. And these societies were class societies. And these societies were, were feudal societies in many ways at the moment of encounter with colonialism. But when we, when we talk about patriarchy, there's a backlash, immediately a knee jerk that says, and from decolonial, uh, uh, so-called decolonial scholars who claim that patriarchy, there was no patriarchy in Africa, that Africa was run, was, was based, was founded on matriarchies and all that. And of course, misrepresenting most of what Sheikh Ante Diop was trying to say. I wish that he had lived long enough so that we could have a debate about uh, some of the things he was saying, because what he has done, what his work has done is it has become the, 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 the big stone that is cast at African women who dare to, to name patriarchy within African uh, pre-colonial societies. So uh, decoloniality does not distance itself from this. In fact, we encounter this knee-jerk claim that you know, uh, black men will say, "I was raised by a matriarch." The women in my society are all matriarchs. You know, so what are you talking about? Women had power, and this is an is, is a distraction. It's a distraction because then we feel uh, obligated to respond. You know, as though we need to defend ourselves from idiocy. It's ridiculous. Anybody who knows anything about history or history, maybe that's where the problem is, it knows that you know, African societies were socially and politically and uh, ethnically structured and that women were always at the bottom of these hierarchies. And to use uh, queens and uh, uh, supposed matriarchs of the ruling classes and then uh, extrapolate for all African women and then claim that African societies were not patriarchal. That for me is deeply problematical. And it often is uh, an argument that comes out of the so-called colonial scholarship. And I, I really do think that uh, when, Af when feminists uh, on the continent begin to engage, when we, we organize the, the, the meeting spaces, virtually or otherwise, and we talk about this, and we bring all our ideas and opinions and standpoints to this issue, it will become a rich, productive, and important contribution to the ways in which uh, we will use feminism to transform our societies. Right now, I mean, uh, we, some of us are voices in the wilderness. <laughs> Largely because many women who name themselves radical do not, maybe I'm speaking for them, I shouldn't, but this is what I suspect. They don't feel confident enough to let go of patriarchal, identi uh, patriarchal feudal identities. They don't, they have not maybe reimagined their identity in new ways. And that is why for me, the, the site of contemporarity is so important because through engagement, through discourse, through commentary, through debates, through arguments and disagreements and agreements and learning, we, 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 we have the opportunities to reshape ourselves. One of the most important things that feminism gifts us 
is the capacity to define ourselves and to redefine ourselves continuously and to unlearn the patriarchalization that we inherit from our societies. And when we unlearn it, we create, we leave a space, we open a space for new types of imaginaries about ourselves, about how to live in communities, about how to be Africans. And that for me is why it's so important to treat our feminism as precious, to defend it, to insist that we define it, that it is a, a, a women's politics of emancipation and of freedom. Did I answer the question, Des? Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I, I, th I really think that it, it's so, ooh, sorry, my video is going on and off. It's just so important right now to you know, what you are saying about nationalism and for us to understand that it's a much broader and, mm. you know, sinister notion of nationalism that you're talking about. You know, it's, it, it's a sense of identity that in some ways seems to be extremely compelling and important because of where we are now. Mm. Um, and in some ways, you, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm waiting for someone to actually speak a bit more about that because yes. it's so easy to neatly pigeonhole patriarchal nationalism as that which is obviously feudalistic and trying to recuperate and shore up, um, you know, really misogynistic traditions. Yeah. But I think that the kind of nationalism that you're talking about now is much more devious than that. And I think this is why it's so important for us to return to the politics of naming and, and why I find your interventions especially significant now. Um, I'm going to see if someone else is going to pick that up. But in the meantime, um, whew, I don't know why I agreed to chair. I know Fatu had a hand up. Habiba wants to ask a question. I really, I think I'm going to ask people to rather ask questions so that I don't uh, distort these. So I'm going to start with Fatu, then I'm going to move on to Habiba, and then Cheryl. Sorry, Cheryl, you were actually first. Yeah. Fatu, go for it. Okay. So thank you. Um, I apologize one for all for my English. I am a wall of speaker. Uh, thank you, Patricia. I found you, your energy and, um, and the way to, to challenge us in our thinking. I think there are two issues I was very glad you brought up. One is about decolonial. I grew up, I was born in colonization and at independence, I was 20 years old. So I know about colonialism, and I know that many Africans fought against colonialism and, uh, and to decolonize uh, our society, the law, the social sciences, the history was something that we were, we were strong doing with more and less successes. But when the concept of decolonial came, I think it was a concept invited by the colonial uh, societies in order for them to understand, ah, yes, we were colonizers, so we need to be decolonial. And I feel trapped because whatever you write, whatever you read, is it's through the lenses of decolonial. And then it seems to me, I cannot put my children and my grandchildren who are 15, between 15 and 20 years old, to feel themselves in a society where decolonial is the most important. Decolonial is part of our world, it's part of our com contemporaneity, but, but at the same time, if we put ourselves in the decolonial framework, then African leaders, that African elite uh, that we have don't have responsibilities. It's not their fault, it's the fault of colonizers, is a fault of uh, post-colonial, is a fault of uh, globalization. And then they can do whatever they want with us. It's a just that it's a framework. So we need, I think that we need to deconstruct that decolonial discourse. 
because we are always referring to the colonial society. You said earlier, I don't feel, I don't want any longer to, to be against whatever white people do. I want to define myself. And as a feminist, we were often we said, yes, you are a white feminist. When I could take in feminism, which is an historical uh, moment, an historical concept, um, uh, values that I can take and can make up for myself, make up for our societies. And the second thing is about patriarchy. And here we are, we are in the patriarchal system because our pre our pre-colonial system, although matriarchy was at the basis of society, but never women were leaders. And I tell to my students and to young women I work with, take the, the name of the chief. They are all male names. You have the Damel, you have the Boer, you have the Serene, you have all those names are male names. And we call them queen, but we call them queen of Rennes. It's a French when they are not. They can be mother of the queen, of the king, sis of the king that gives them some status. But as we say, yeah, they are in a lower and in a lower position. And we are always trapped by this, um, uh, the el not even the, all the elite, eh? because many people in Senegal, for instance, many people, when you say you have feminists, say, no, this is still white feminism. Because in our society, we gave to our mothers uh, the, the power, we gave them the, the rights, which is totally, totally wrong. And when, we are, uh, when I hear my colleagues, and I don't want to give names uh, because we know all of them, my young colleagues who are very brilliant writers says, the, the strength of Africa is that we have a, a lot of young generation we are going to be by, uh, in 50 years, the most important population. And I often say, but this population is coming out of our uterus. What about our uterus? Are you going to produce all those black kids around who go on the ships? Do you think that we have some time, something different to do than just being in matriarchy? I am a mother of four, so I know what I'm talking about. But to think, that with matriarchy, all our status is, uh, is uh, defined, our power is designed. I think it's just um, a trick that uh, our male chauvinist uh, black uh, patriarchs really designed for us. I'm sorry, uh, uterus? Yes, it's about our uterus. It's our uterus producing all those, you know, Currently in France, there is a debate because we are going to uh, elections and for the president in uh, six or eight months. And the, and the right and far right, it discusses about the replacement of white in France because they realize that most, mostly people who are give, still giving birth are uh, uh, people of, North, of African descent, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. And they are, they are desperate that you are going to have a more and more black in front, which is a white Christian uh, nation. And, but in that debate, and when, when we pick back that debate, we are saying, this is our power. We are going to produce all those black, we are going to conquer the world. But what about our uterus? What are our bellies? Our bellies are going to, to be bearing all those uh, black kids. I'm, I'm just sipping out there, but, our, but I find, Patricia, your discourse fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm done. Thank you, Fatu. Uh, Pat um, and everybody, uh, there've been a lot of comments and questions that em have emerged. So I'm going to say, actually Cheryl, because you asked your question long ago, um, Pat, are you open to taking three comments slash questions yes. at once? Cheryl, yes, okay, Fatu followed by Cheryl and Habiba. And then we'll move on to the others that I've been able to follow in the chat. And um, yeah, uh, Pat raised okay. hand. I'll, 
I'll uh, say something really quick. Thank you so much for your talk. It's very inspiring. Um, I teach on, um, I'm US based, uh, teach on African women's movements among other classes. And I also do some work in a few countries on, on the continent on gender and food security and violence against women allied with local uh, women activists. Um, and my question is stemming a lot from the class discussion uh, my students had yesterday about how do we transform systems? And you mentioned uh, transforming systems. And also in my gender and food security uh, work um, on the continent, women have talked about how do we get to transformative changes? And what does that even mean and look like? So if you could just speak, speak to that a bit, your own ideas on that, um, th that'd be great. Thank you. Um, okay, so okay. Cheryl, Sorry, Pat, can we yeah. just have you a want third me to take three? Person? Okay. Um, so that we, uh, the third person I have is Ntombi. Ntombi, can you just summarize? I, I know you've put your question in the chat. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Okay. McFadden. My question is that uh, uh, for you, Prof. McFadden, what were some of the costs you had to pay for being feminist and radical at your younger age? Uh, as a young feminist, I feel that my radicalism is sometimes, but most of the time, costly. The alienation from both men and women, of course, even in professional spaces. However, for me as an individual, and I started this journey when I was 18 at DWC, being a feminist has been the most healing and rewarding political commitment for myself, my traumas, and how I continue to engage with the world. But I'm very interested on how you dealt with a lot of the costs that you had to endure by being a feminist. Thank you. Des, you want me to respond? Pat, please do. Then we'll take yes. the next round afterwards. Okay. So uh, um, the last question. Oh, you have such a beautiful name, and now it's off. Um, so my sister, you know, you you answered the question actually because you said feminism has been uh, basically the most beautiful gift you've given yourself, and so. It's always like that. Uh, because you are so you because you are isolated, you are othered, uh, you are vilified, you are told that you're crazy, that you're a freak, um, because you don't conform. Uh, and uh, and that that attack uh, sometimes uh, causes us to forget the joy and the pleasure and the power that we get by being feminist. Uh, and we have to remind ourselves all the time, we have to remind ourselves that feminism is the most beautiful gift and the most powerful politics you can endow yourself with. And you can see that uh, when you live your feminism, you experience your freedom. It doesn't matter what vilification you encounter. When you live your politics for you, not only do you get rewarded, but all the people that you love and who love you are rewarded too. And of course, the society begins to change. Imagine, we are so few. There's seven, eight billion human beings. We are so few as feminists. But look at the massive impact we have on human society. Very, very few. We are minuscule, you know, and so many of us have given up because it's an it's an exhausting journey, but it's worth it. And just remind yourself, you're so beautiful. Your smile tells me that you have given yourself the most powerful gift, <laughs> and you're living your feminism. You're living your freedom, and and this is what I always say, you know. Take yourself back to yourself where your power resides and nobody else can take that from you. Okay, sometimes they kill us. I mean, I'm in a huge, massive battle in, in my, in, it's not my family, it's actually my father's family. Very hateful, conservative, reactionary people. 
who dislike me intensely, intensely. And I've been under, I've been in a war zone. I came back to this mountain thinking I was coming back to a family when I should have known better. After 50 years of being a radical feminist interrogating the hetero, uh, 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 hetero patriarchal family, I knew, I knew that it's the most dangerous place for women. The majority of women are killed in the hetero patriarchal family. We learn, you know, how to hate ourselves. We are destroyed in there, but we still have this longing for belonging. We want to belong. And so when we experience grief the way I did, we fall back into that, into that place where we long for human support, for solidarity, for love. And of course, we've been told so many times in our lives that the family is where you will get it, the safest place that, you know, and yet it's not. We know as feminists, it's the most dangerous place for females. Look at the statistics. The majority of us are mauled in families. You know, we're killed in families. We, it's, it's a dangerous, dangerous place, you see. So we, we, you, you balance that. You ask yourself, is it worth being oppressed and subjugated and intimidated for the rest of your life? Knowing that just around the corner, in yourself, you are beautiful, strong, powerful, indomitable, you know, unconquerable, <laughs> you are everything for you. You are enough. And for me, that's where I return always. It's difficult. It will always be difficult as long as the majority of women don't find the courage to love themselves and to fight back. For them, start with you because you can't fight back. You can't fight for other people when you don't know how to fight for yourself. When you are not fighting for you, when you're not protecting you, you know, it's a fake politics. And it's, a, it's something that national, we learn from nationalism, you know, and we bring it, we carry it into our movement, into our organizations, into our politics. And of course, we live a lie. Uh, we never reach our freedom. So my sister, what you're doing, you got it. <laughs> That's the place to be. You are enough for yourself. And I, Patricia always reminds me that that's where we're at. That's where it's at, <laughs> you know, and then that's where we've stayed um, since, you know, since I was a teenager. Um, once I found that place, I, I, I was indomitable. Nobody can do anything, you can't touch me. And I don't care who you are, I don't care. Um, and uh, I've shown it now many times in the so-called family and um, uh, those who, who try to break me, I fight back and I, I win. I fight back because you have the power in you to win every single time. Uh, even if they take your body, your spirit remains beautiful, powerful, unconquered because the, the, the objective of patriarchy is to conquer, is to conquer to break, uh, to occupy. And you can see, you know, racist colonialists perform that. Uh, uh, we see it uh, all across our societies, the expressions of conquering, of pillaging, of exploitation, you know, and we are the first to experience it in and on our bodies as female humans. And, and we know how to fight back. We just have to retrieve that memory and bring it into the contemporary moment. And uh, be, there must be more of us, more of us. We cannot wait on the sidelines, waiting for the few radical women to solve the problem because we cannot solve the problem on our own. We can speak and bring what we have, but we are only one at a time. But when there are multitudes of us, then we make the shift and it's manageable. It's, you know, it's, um, um, it's enduring. So yes, you made me very happy, my sister. Thank you. Now, uh, some, uh, uh, Cheryl O'Brien, your, your questions are very large. And I, I, I had hoped that with my presentation, 
uh, because that's what my presentation was really. It was about the question that you asked. So maybe you can listen to the presentation again and view the video. Yeah, it's going to be a, an audio anyway. And you may be able to find um, maybe some gems there which will uh, enable you um, uh, to proceed on your journey as a teacher, as a learner, as someone who works you know, um, with women and for women. Uh, but I, I cannot repeat my, my presentation. Um, and I think that uh, I answered all, both of your questions. So Des, I'm ready for another round. Great, thank you. So I'm going to, I've got uh, next, because these are connected, uh, Pumla and Habiba um, and Unifa and Sheena. Pat, are you up to four? Especially if I ask people to really, you know, consider that this is limited time and keep their comments slash questions brief. Honey, you know me, I'm in a pleasure zone right now. <laughs> okay, let's go for it. No, we're enjoying this. This is so in wonderful. A, in a vegan ice cream shop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Pumla, Habiba, um, Unifa and Sheila. Hi, Pumla. Pumla was on a phone. I think she was struggling to get here. Uh, let me see if she's still here. She's here, but she's muted. Okay, let's ask Habiba to go first. Habiba, are you okay? Yes. Oh, I know. I think, can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Okay. Pumla? Sorry, I don't know. I, 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 was, uh, I was driving and I didn't want to miss Pat. So I, no, I, I, don't know, I don't know how to do it properly on my phone. So I... So that's why I'm I'm so messy. Um, okay, I understand. I, know what I I'm tried doing. the other day; it was a disaster. I know. I just arrived home, and I didn't want to have an echo because I tried. Anyway, so my no. question was, and I miss, I'll just read it because I don't want to cause more. Okay. Craziness. Um, Pat, thank you so much. My question was around. Um, I'll just read it. So this is what I wrote. Thank you very much for this very exciting theorization of um, contemporaneity for us as feminist pads. I think it's a crucial and certainly for me a much needed shift. You started to talk about how it relates to retrieval and also, for example, what returning to the source. But I'd like you to be less quick here, please, in outlining what you see as the links between contemporaneity and senses of the past. And I'm speaking about feminist past, so radical African feminist past, legacies and traditions, for, for example. Um, I hope that's clear. I, th I think that's clear. Um, I just... Yeah, no, I, I think if we're going to take it forward, we can um, always do that. Let's just have Habiba's question and then we'll have uh, another two after that. Pat, if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, Habiba. Pat, uh, it's nourishing to hear you. And I have a recipe for a vegan ice cream I'd love to share with you. Um, I want to ask, ask us all. <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely, I, I will. Um, I want to ask you, Pat, about uh, the power of consumerism uh, as a deeply felt need especially for people who were uh, excluded from so much in the past. And then it is, the, is as though eating meat and um, buying clothes are a deeply felt need, not a desire, but a need. And so I'm wondering how you could help us understand how to make the idea of not, of choosing not to consume, choosing not to buy, choosing not to eat meat, all of these things that are beyond pleasure, almost felt as a, as a, as a, a right, because we've, we've been kept from so much in the past. I, I wonder how we can share that because living in the North, I see so much waste that just breaks my heart waste as an ordinary ordinary unnoticed practice 
And so I, I wonder, in the north, I think that is a, a work that people have to do here. But on the continent, how do we speak about abstention and um, consuming less as a route to the joy and the abundance and the community that you you speak of so compellingly? Thank you. Uh, Pat, do you, can you take two more or do you want to respond? No, let me do these two. Okay. Can you start with uh, with um, Habiba? Uh, uh, Habiba is from uh, my darling, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so uh, this question you've raised uh, really is close to my heart because like almost every single female human on earth over the last century, I was traumatized by, uh, by body politics and by being ugly because I wasn't a certain BMI and because I wasn't skinny, uh, anorexic and all that, you know, because we've been exposed to that. But also the other side of it. And so becoming vegan, I didn't expect that my body would re-equilibrate itself, that it would find its balance because that's what veganism has done for me. You know, and food changed, the meaning of food changed. And when we had the last conversation with Des, which was uh, very seriously interfered with, we were talking about what food means in terms of the colonial rupture and the absence of, uh, of labor and of bodies in the rural spaces of the continent and of Southern Africa in particular with the migration systems and all that. And that we do need to return there to ask what happened to food in our context? How did food become this toxicity, this bulk, this crap that is killing us? but which is providing a windfall for pharmaceuticals with, through the diabetes, the hypertension, and oh, and the broken black female bodies in particular, but also male bodies, you know, broken and just dying, you know, barely able to move. And it's such a crisis, it's so tragic. And yet the need that people think they are feeding, they can never feed because it's directly linked with the trauma of colonization, of brutalization, and of being alienated from the most crucial resources that any living thing needs, which is the earth, the trees, the plants, the rain, the opportunities that nature provides us so that we can be well, so that we can nurture ourselves. So we become akin to industrialized animals in so many ways. It's a dangerous place I'm going uh, because you know the animal rights people <laughs> and all those debates. But what the white farmers, for example, in South Africa and the white farmers in the US produce is to feed excluded communities, bulk, pork, uh, chicken that is traumatized and brutalized through cigarettes. So we consume this terror and trauma. And what it does is that it destroys us. It makes our bodies dysfunctional. So we long to, to fill the gap, but we, it's like, an, it is actually an addiction, but it has so many tentacles in the system um, and uh, what for me what changed when I became vegan is that I no longer weighed myself I no longer uh, thought oh, so bad that I had had three meals a day because food changed its meaning in my life I removed the toxins by growing most of my own food the pleasure the delight the thankfulness when I bring in those beetroots or I bring in that lovely lettuce that just grew on its own in a corner in my garden, you know? And, uh, you know, 
and and it's a it's it's a joy it's a sense of joy that Shalja speaks to you know and which has and which uh, 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 Alice Walker also has shared with us and crafted for us and when we read Alice's work around joy we know that that's the place we need to go to so this critical food studies program that Dares has so courageously uh, begun you know made available to us provides us with an opportunity to speak not only to the connections with trauma, with racism, with exclusion, with brutality, but also to the possibilities that we can return to our bodies, retrieve the abilities and capacities of our bodies to, to, to be joyful, to be a musical instruments, balanced and you know, giving us joy. And for me, that is so, 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 so important. Thank you so much for raising this issue because there are so many debates around being vegan and, um, you know, and we don't want to become sucked into the inter intellectuality of it. We want to remain uh, on a course where we are harvesting the knowledge of um, who we are as African people who grow, who grew beautiful food and who can still grow that beautiful food. And that is a link that connects me with what Pumla may have been asking. Those sensibilities about um, who we were, what we had, what we knew and how to retrieve them and how to return to those sources of life, of pleasure, of giving ourselves but doing it with a clear understanding that nationalism has cast a, 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 a fog over it, has appropriated it and made it uh, something that is articulated in a different way and it no longer works for us. You know, and you can see, for example, the ways in which feudalism and nationalism construct the ideas of traditionalism as business. In South Africa, it's the end thing, you know? Now they're talking about agriculture, black men who are going to be commercial farmers, the land, Jobotitis are there, you know? But the core issues about the production of food that is human nurturing and human friendly and which comes from the earth that has been treated with respect and love, that is not being discussed. It's all about capitalism. It's about how to further capitalism, how to avoid the crises of capitalism in the production, in agricultural production or in industrial production. And they're just pushing the industrialization of animals, you know, so, and the ge genetic modification of seeds. So it's a complete crisis that is just being expanded and deepened. And we as radical women who are becoming contemporary, we have to step into our societies in new ways and create these alternative discourses, these alternative sites, these alternative opportunities of becoming new and different people who are healthy, who are well. Actually, I hate it when people say, when I serve a meal and somebody says, oh, this is a healthy meal, as, suck, as though it's a, you know, it's, it's abnormal. <laughs> no, it's not healthy. It's vegan. <laughs> and it's beautiful and it's delicious. The health part comes after you've consumed it. <laughs> so yeah, the, the, comp the conversations are complicated. I'm right at the beginning of this lovely journey with all of my sisters. So I'm hoping that we will have many op opportunities to talk, to raise the questions. I don't have all the answers. I could never have all the answers and I don't want to have all the answers uh, because I never will. I just want to bring what I feel and know and experience and what gives me joy to the conversation. That's all. And uh, so the, the, uh, the uh, Pumla, I think being alert to the ways in which nationalism has positioned itself between the past and the present is a, a core sensibility that we have to cultivate 
and interrogate and theorize and ask um, new questions around so that we can strip the influences of nationalism um, and we can return uh, to uh, looking at where we come from and in new and different ways that enable us not only to retrieve the knowledges, the songs, the melodies, um, the resonances of who we are, but also that those can become stepping stones into creating new societies. I hope I was able to respond. It's a big question. We'll have many conversations about it in the future, I hope. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. I, I, I really, yeah. And thank you, Habiba and Pumla. I think those are crucial questions. And, you know, the discussion around what intersectionality, if we really think about yes. what it means to be intersectional as opposed to sort of simply stringing up race, class, and gender. Um, yes. You know, what, what, what are our, our current struggles? Thanks very much for that. So, um, I think there are two more questions and we have time just a little bit for those. Um, and I'm very sorry if I've left people out. Unifa and Sheena. Uh, Unifa, are you still there? Yes, Habiba, thanks sorry. for the recipe. Unifa, <laughs> yeah, you're there. I'm Hi. Here. Hello. Um, I think that so much of what I asked has been in some ways addressed, but I will still continue to, um, to pose the question. Um, I made the comment um, thanking you, Professor McFadden, for your power, for your care, um, for shaking us, but also simultaneously holding us. And um, I think that a lot of what I'm going to ask uh, is, was addressed in um, how you spoke um, about, um, you know, the joy of being in your garden, of, um, you know, being vegan, of um, expressing um, and allowing yourself to, um, to express yourself in those, in those ways. Um, but my question was, would you walk us through your rejection of subjecthood um, that which you do through intersectionality, vegan practice, growing your own garden and re-loving your body. <laughs> okay, all right, it's a big one. <laughs> Sorry, but um, do you mind taking Sheena's as well? Oh, yes. Okay, Sheena, are you still there? Uh, yes, I am. I hope you can okay. hear me, there's thunderstorms where I am. Thank you so much for for this space, I um, I feel like in the company of very many feminists whom I absolutely admire, and um, it's quite an honor. Um, uh, comrade Patricia, my my question, yeah, in some ways, like uh, Unifier has been has been answered in different parts and places, but I do feel that um, the question of uh, you know eco-degradation and ecological violence and um, the harm that is happening to the environment. Um, a lot of it, the, the white West dominate, dominates, has the power to dominate a narrative that makes us all feel like we have to be responsible. Even though the reality is that it's, it's the uh, minority um, world, at least uh, financially, or geographically, so to speak, that are responsible are responsible for a large percent of the waste. It's not it's not us who have uh, who've had a pick and pay paper bags folded, and our mother sinks since we were little in our handbags, who take our shoes to be patched and patched and patched, and who have tailors who refresh the same outfit over and over again. This is something we have been able to do. The way we consume uh, when you are black and working class looks very different to um, how consumption looks like in the West. But somehow the narrative right now makes all of us feel like we are equally responsible for the waste in the world. And therefore we, we need to um, you know, buy less, uh, we're already buying less, we need to eat less meat, we're already eating or producing less meat, et cetera, et cetera. How do we participate the language for participating in fora and spaces where we are being told that we are responsible for the waste in the world when we know we are not? How do we 
how do we do this? How do we how do we push back, and um, in ways that acknowledge that this is a problem, a global problem, regardless of who is responsible for it, but also highlight the fact that don't make me feel responsible for something that I am in my everyday life and me as a black, queer, working class uh, person living in an African country and not contributing that much waste and degradation to. Sorry, it's so long-winded. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important. Thank you. Yes, so I'll respond to the two. Um, Sheena, you know, don't go into spaces where you're going to have to expand energy explaining somebody's idiocy. This is my advice to you, my sister. Don't make different types of choices. That's what I would do. That's what I've done. Because we only have limited time to live our lives in beautiful ways. And swirling around us is all the muck that capitalism has dumped. So making a choice not to enter a site where you are going to be expected and feel obligated to uh, explain to somebody something they already know. The statistic that, you, that US citizens consume 65 times as much as uh, Africans do, that is, it comes from the West. So, the, the, you know, we get caught up um, in a discourse that they hegemonize, they define, and we, we spend a lot of our energy in these spaces. And the, the, one of the things that I did, which was really an impulse for me almost 20 years ago, was to lean back and step away. And it's amazing how powerful that is. And to choose the site that you enter and to choose and decide whether you're going to speak or not. Nobody can force you, you don't have to. You know, as black women, we've learned the obligation uh, of, it, it, we've learned a sense of obligation, let me put it that way. That, you know, it's, it's I, don't, I don't have the language for it, I can't explain it, but I think you know what I'm saying, you know? And it, it comes from a sense of altruism that we, we need to explain ourselves all the time. We don't need to. You just make the choice, find your courage, lean back, step, step away and live your life and do your life differently. That energy, you can redirect it into the alternative. You can redirect it into ways that are about, for example, uh, um, uh, consuming less. Oh yes, we do need to consume less because we share the planet with everybody. Even though we know that the North, the plunderers and pillagers, they are the worst of the um, ecocidists. So, uh, uh, but make the small changes in your life. And I found that those small changes are massive in terms of participating in the crafting of the alternative. So I have not bought new clothes for several years now. And my, to my sister, uh, uh, um, Habiba, you know, <laughs> you did mention the issue of consumerism, it's an addiction. But I have been to the US several times in the past four or five years, and I did not buy anything new, except maybe two pairs or three pairs of socks. And it was so, so liberating and so powerful for me. I brought a lot of vegan food because I can't find it here. So my suitcase was full of, <laughs> you know, cooler packs with vegan food and the clothing that I had left home with. And I felt so rewarded by the discipline that I had exercised on my addiction to buy stuff. And even now, I haven't bought clothing and shoes and things like that, which I had become, I mean, I had really believed that I couldn't survive without shopping, which many middle-class women, petty bourgeois women, black women, we get sucked into this consumerist hook. It's a trap. And now my house is still full of clothing. I'm still discovering clothing that I didn't know I had bought. So that's another way 
of dealing with this issue of how do we return respect to the earth by minimizing participation in the consumerism systems, but also by engaging in those activities that, for example, encourage the birds to come into our yards. So we grow trees that have berries or we grow trees that, you know, that bring shade or, and, and those are the magical ingredients of the alternative. And my notion of contemporary is really about that, that each of us explores our situatedness where we are, we can't all be sitting on a mountain growing delicious beetroot. <laughs> we will never be. But when we have an engagement with people, working people in the rural spaces who have access to land through a program that expects them to, to, to grow commodified, genetically modified seed, we can take that opportunity to speak, to say, let's find the indigenous uh, uh, seeds. Let's find the indigenous tuber. Let's let's find the ways of bringing back the food that is good for us: the cassava, the sweet potato, not the potatoes that came from Ireland, because they are water guzzlers and they're genetically modified. And you don't need. I haven't eaten a potato for I don't know how many years. But I eat sweet potatoes. They're resilient. They're delicious. They're full of nutrition. They're beautiful to look at. You know, and they always give. So these are the, the, the kinds of things that we can think about. We can open new doors in our minds and we will find the new ideas and the new possibilities. So that's Mushina, my comrade. <laughs> that was interesting. I haven't been called comrade for a long time. <laughs> um, uh, 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 Thank you so much. You're most welcome, darling. You're most welcome. And then, uh, Unifa, you know, um, uh, I miss you very much, actually. It was lovely to see your image. And, uh, you know, I really, um, I still savor our conversations, the conversations that we had in Boston. And I thank you again for sharing that time with me. It was very hectic. And uh, there was a lot of demand uh, on you. Uh, and I was watching and thinking, well, okay. The patriarchy is at it again. <laughs> you must do this. You must, it must be everybody's dog's body. Um, but you resisted. And we sat quietly in a corner in the hotel. And we, we made a connection. And it, we, we, it was really beautiful. And I still, uh, those are precious, precious, precious moments. I keep them in my heart. Thank you. Now to answer the question that you posed. For me, uh, the ways in which I revel in this little life that I've built for myself is that I remind myself all the time that there are, there are many, many precious gifts that I am given every day, amongst which are autonomy and uh, sustenance. My autonomy is one of the most powerful and most beautiful elements of my life as a feminist. And so when I'm working in my garden or when I'm um, searching for a pain reliever for somebody or making a healing mixture for someone, you know, or just looking for something that will satisfy me because I'm longing for something. And I, I'm enjoying, I'm, at, I'm experiencing my autonomy. Autonomy is a very central notion in feminism. And uh, it enables us to create uh, safe zones around us in, because we live in, uh, in, in very, very vicious and hateful uh, uh, spaces, uh, whether it's in hetero patriarchal families or in workspaces where we Formal workspaces or on the roads. So when we are autonomous, we can draw particular energies from our autonomy. And, uh, and that's what sustains me, really. I don't know if I heard your question the way I am responding to it, 
but um you know um <laughs> living a life of joy <laughs> Uh, it's really, you know, oh, that's where it's at. As Nina Simone would say, that's where it's at. <laughs> so, yeah. Next time I see you, um, we will pick up the conversation where we left it today and last time in post. <laughs> Thank in, you uh, so, the so much the for your generosity. You're most welcome, baby. You're most welcome. It's so lovely to see you. Again, lovely. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Pat. I, um, yeah, my sense is that, you know, what you said about joy is so connected to what you said throughout. Um, you know, that we think about joy in terms of this sort of capitalist commodity driven notion of, okay, here it is, you know, comes as a package. But mm. um, for me, you've been saying that it comes as a process. Um, and there are moments where, you know, you sort of register a, a sense of realization of possibility and what you have come against that are incredible. And I've certainly many other people, many, many other people have valued tremendously how you have provided this um, evidence of that. Um, we've reached a point where we need to leave but I do know that <laughs> some people really want to say more things so I'm going to hang around Pat are you able to hang around who me yes yes okay. I mean I'm in a space but of joy <laughs> you're in a space of joy I'm also in a space of joy so I, I can see it yes, around, I can see it I love it. <laughs> but yeah, no, people who need to leave understood. It was a scheduled seminar from five to seven South African time. And uh, that time has passed. So I understand if people have other commitments. Um, but those who want to stay, I'm Sydney here, Pat's here. Um, I'm enjoying this conversation tremendously. So I'm certainly open to staying. Are there any other comments uh, that I've missed? I think I can see, uh, see your hands if you raise them again. Um, okay. Just look through. Anybody wants to go back? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think people have really just... And There's a question I, from Vanessa Ludwig. Oh, Vanessa, sorry. Yeah. Vanessa, are you here still? Please. Yeah, uh, I'm still here, Israel. I'm still here. Okay, Vanessa, go for it. <laughs> I don't know Hi. where to run to now. I'm, I'm like caught up in Pat's beetroot. So. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, it's, it's a this is another avid grower. <laughs> oh my goodness, we really oh need yes, to talk, no, no, Vanessa grows. <laughs> Vanessa's garden's amazing for years. But but, but I, I wanted. I, I really thanks, Pat. I mean, as usual, you know, you you speak to my soul and you make my spirit fly. So thanks very much. Oh, um, I actually wanted to ask a bit about if we just speak a bit more about the concept of feudal patriarchy that we have to reject, particularly in the light of, of, of the decoloniality um, uh, era that we are living in, where people are tr trying, is trying to reclaim, so, so called reclaim our pre colonial identities, or our so called pre colonial identities, many of which, were, of course, were formed during colonial time, during the wars against mm. um, colonialism, but we, but we pretend that these are pre-colonial identities. And like, but like in South Africa, I mean, it really irritates me that we have all these nations rising and that the, 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 the official nation state government recognizes these nations and, 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 and how this kind of interplays mm. with the, the many nations within a nation state. And what does this mean for, for, for women's uh, liberation, women's struggle, women's liberation, because, I mean, the fact that we want to have things like, like indigenous courts and things like that, which we know are going to be patriarchal, which we are now going to be misogynistic. So I, I really wanted to speak a bit more about that, because I really like that idea of rejecting the feudal patriarchy in our contemporary times. Thank you.
So, um, Des, you want me to? Please, yeah. Okay. No. I've, so I've it's a great question. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Vanessa. And, um, you know, it's for me, it's an exploratory uh, thinking process right now because, uh, like I said at the beginning, it, 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 you know, stepping back from the, the noise of the norm has sort of enabled me to see the, the bits, the, the outlines uh, of the infrastructure of neocolonialism. And it also has, um, and I mean, it has provoked me to, uh, to redefine what neocolonialism means. Because we often talk about the ways in which colonialism colluded with the, you know, the patriarchs and uh, the feudal infrastructure. We don't, but we don't actually use that language. We say traditional chiefs, we say, you know, um, uh, kings and headmen and things like that. But the language doesn't facilitate a critical understanding of how feudalism, it's feudalism, and, and how feudalism has been redressed uh, as in dressing in a new garb. Uh, in ways that make it seem like it has always been there and it will always be there. It has been, a, and so our identities are attached to this unchanging fossilized notion of what Africanness is. But we actually haven't interrogated the ideological implications of this, uh, the, the political and uh, the deeply violent ways in which feudalism is deployed against women in particular, but against working people in general. And this is new work that we have to do because the nationalists are not going to do it. They want to sweeten it. And they've been sweetening it by uh, uh, naming it culture, tradition, you know, these things that are um, innate in us that make us Africans. But feudalism is feudalism. It's a universal phenomenon. You can look at all the societies that developed to a particular uh, uh, level in terms of exchange and commoditization and, and hierarchies of ruling and power, all of them they created particular forms of feudalism. And uh, we need to call it feudalism. We need to name it. Because if we don't name it, we cannot, uh, we cannot um, undress it. We cannot reject it. You know the old, what is it called? Uh, the story about the naked emperor. I mean, we have to say the, naked, the emperor is naked, you know? And this is feudalism. Once we name it, we can begin to enter the interstices of the system where the connections are made and how it sustains itself and sustains neocolonialism and redefines, uh, gives neocolonialism a particular sensibility particular meaning, which draws from the ancient narratives uh, that have become uh, reinvented, and they're now sustaining these very cruel uh, globalized systems of extraction and exploitation and exclusion. So it's that interface between these colluding systems, which I think is exciting for the new feminist work. And you know the pushback comes because people uh, 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 need something that says that they were beautiful before the white man came and sullied us, painted us and tarred and feathered us and told us we were ugly and stupid and coming from nowhere. 
And it's that romanticism, that desire to belong to something that enables this duplicitous uh, collusion to persist. And when you talk about many nations within any, I think that the nationalists, the elites are running a huge risk. You can see what's going on with Guazulu Natal. You know, that thing is on shaky legs right now because it's always at the point where it's going to dissolve and it's going to implode. And Zuma represents the avatar <laughs> that <laughs> in a peculiar and really freaky way. You know what I'm saying? And of course, this characterizes neocolonial politics and black elitism across our continent. But you know, we don't want to try and rescue a past that was manufactured and engineered and reinvented and recalibrated so that it can become a, a support for, a, a, for, for the continuation of colonialism and, and, and capitalism. We want to understand how the systems work so that we can craft an alternative to them. And that's what I think we have to do, Vanessa. We have to speak to the intricacies uh, of the, the relations of power that have been occluded by these declarations that these are traditions, that these are sacred and untouchable. And these are inherently African authenticated. We have to blow that thing out. You know, we have to explode it and, and expose it. And that is why I say the decolonial project is just another layer, another veneer, you know, which draws from these, um, uh, these what I think are really despicable uh, uh, representations of Africanness that are fake and that are, uh, are central to the sustenance of exploitative and repressive systems um, in our societies. So the decolonialists can, uh, can uh, they probably will attack me, but that's cool. I like a good fight. Uh, <laughs> but what I'm saying to the decolonialists is this, say something new. Say something new, make me interested. You know, stop saying the same thing over and over with tired. I don't listen to it anyway, and I don't even read the stuff anymore because they're saying anything new. It's just, yeah, new wolves in a sheepskin, in new sheepskins. <laughs> so Vanessa, it's a conversation that I'm hoping we will have. Uh, because it is going to have serious ramifications. They're not going to be able to hold this uh, juggling act together. You can see it everywhere. Look at Sudan. Look at, I mean, everywhere, everywhere it's imploding because they maintain these systems to control the people, to control us, to keep us away from the state, from claiming our rights, our entitlements, from transforming, you know, certain spaces so that we could become citizens in fuller ways. They have used this feudal system effectively and efficiently, efficiently, but to their demise, because it's not sustainable. And that is why the alternative is so urgent, mm. because we also live here and we also have futures and we don't want to be swept up in the chaos and the crises that the neoliberalists and the neocolonialists, you know, have been brewing uh, through their greed and their collusionary behavior with uh, with Western imperialists. So, I, I, you know, it's something that we could go on and on and on about. Mm. But I'm hoping that we will have more serious, more considered conversations uh, from from a, from feminist perspective, because Pumla's question was also sort of interfaces with the point you raised. Vanessa, and uh, these are possibilities for us to, to, to speak, to, um, to do the new work, to, you know, uh, to define and identify the new tasks and the challenges and the joys and the celebrations. You know, we're around, we're still here, you know, <laughs> and those of us who left, we're going to come back. <laughs> yeah, so there it is. Okay.
Pat, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who participated, who joined. There is, of course, a recording and I see, oh my goodness, all these familiar names. Um, <laughs> we need to revisit a lot of conversations. What I enjoyed about this conversation is that they, you know, they came from the perspective of women who are grappling. Yeah. Um, I am so tired of conversations where that are you know, appropriated by men who want to destroy and attack. And I didn't get that sense here. Mm -hmm. um, but Pat, thank you, thank you, thank you for You're everything. You're most welcome. <laughs> and, and we will and thank you for the pleasure to have more conversations. Um, yeah. So let's leave it there and let's think about what we do next. <laughs> absolutely I, yes just call and i will be there <laughs> i know <laughs> bye everybody have a wonderful evening bye jess thank you so much bye Des. thanks so much bye bye bye, thank bye you. everyone thank you very much thank amazing you bye Fatu. <laughs> bye 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 darlings I love Bye. you. Bye. Love Bye. you Bye. too. Bye. Love Bye. you too. Bye. Tons and Bye. tons Bye. and tons. Bye. 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 Hello. Hello. Hi, baby. Bye. Bye. I still exist. Bye. You are so gorgeous. <laughs> Look at you. Oh, I love this. Bye, everybody. Love you, Bye, Pat. Rhoda calling from Trinidad. Hey, Hi. Rhoda. Oh my God, it's been goddess. It's been so many wow. years. <laughs> Thanks so much. You're most welcome, darling. You're most welcome, my sister. <laughs>